How can rheumatoid arthritis affect our spine? So for this week's Sunday case study, I'm coming to you from San Francisco at this year's CNS annual meeting. We have a 75 year old female who presents with a history of rheumatoid arthritis and neck pain. She's had neck pain over the years and has actually had multiple spinal procedures done to her neck, but presents with worsening difficulty walking. Her hands, arms, and feet seem to be going numb, and she has gotten to the point where she can no longer walk without the assistance of a walker or a cane. On neurological examination, her hands are curled up like this and she really can't use her hands. She attributed this to her history of rheumatoid. She also has difficulty with her balance and her Romberg sign was positive. Her reflexes were very brisk and she had a positive Babinski sign and positive clonus. Here is her MRI scan. I'm gonna scroll through the sagittal images of her MRI of her cervical spine and pausing on this middle sagittal image and then continuing to scroll across the sagittal images. So a few questions that I have for you guys this week is one, obviously, what is the diagnosis? I mentioned on physical examination, all of those findings, and what does that mean exactly? Why would her reflexes be brisk and why would she have difficulty walking? Obviously, the next question is, what did I do to treat the problem? And the last question is, was her history of rheumatoid arthritis relevant or not? Stay tuned tomorrow and I'll go through the whole case. This is a work of art. So let's go through the answers of the case study I presented yesterday on this 75 year old female with a history of rheumatoid arthritis and progressive trouble with walking and weakness. So mentioned that she had very brisk reflexes on physical examination and a positive Babinski sign and clonus. And I asked, what does that mean? Brisk reflexes and Babinski and clonus are signs of upper motor neuron disease, meaning signs of spinal cord compression. So in this patient with neck pain and difficulty walking, weakness, and hyperreflexia all points to an issue with her cervical spine. In other words, just from her history and her physical examination, she has cervical myelopathy likely. So let's look at her MRI. When we look at an MRI scan of the cervical spine, this is C2, this is C3, and then these black rectangles are the discs. Now it should look like something like this where you have a square, and a disc and a square and a disc, etc. These all look a little unusual up here is because these are the vertebrae that have been fused. This is the base of the brain. This is the brain stem. And then the spinal cord comes down through here. Now, what is this thing right here? This is the problem. So what we see here is the brain stem coming down and then being extremely compressed through here. And then the spinal cord coming down here. So this is narrowed to just one to two millimeters by this mass-like projection. Here is a cartoon rendition of what we're looking at. This is the C2 vertebrae, and then this is a mass projecting off the C2 vertebrae called a cervical panis. Now our C12 joint called the atlantoaxial joint is what allows us to rotate our head side to side. It provides 50% of our lateral rotation of our neck. Since C12 is a synovial joint like most joints in our body, it can be affected by arthritis and is somewhat susceptible in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. A cervical panis is caused from inflammation and is very common in rheumatoid patients causing cervical spinal cord compression. If left untreated, it could actually kill someone. So we've answered three of the questions. And the last question is, how do we treat this? C2 is actually located in the back of our throat. So to try to go through and remove the panis directly, it would require a transoral approach, which is highly morbid. If we just simply immobilize the joint and prevent it from moving anymore, the panis could actually go away on its own. So the treatment is spinal fusion. So here is what I did in this patient's case. She was already fused anteriorly, C4 to T1. So I went posteriorly and fused her skull base down to T1 by adding these rods and screws, and I decompressed the area of the compression in the upper cervical spine. After surgery, she did well and was subsequently discharged home after several days stay in the hospital. After several months, her weakness improved and she was actually able to ambulate without any assistant devices. Now the weakness in her hands didn't get all the way better because the spinal cord compression had been going on for so long, but we did improve the quality of her life tremendously. Stay tuned next week for another case.